many of you like those videos? <laughs> it's great to see what God is doing. And that I, I love it when the message is just they're saying us, you know, it's about the soul. It's not about anything else. It's about lives being lives coming to Jesus and never being the same again. I don't know if you've heard, uh, we've kind of been talking with the people on the streets, people on the streets, the people who are working under the streets to see how big of a job that is. And um, it's not official yet because the report isn't done, but it could be four months that we won't have this space over. Um, so what that means on two levels, one, you really have to work to get here Sunday. And that's great. Because there's something, I'll tell you the Bible verse that, that sums it up for me. It's in Hebrews, and it says, uh, without faith it's impossible. Because those who come to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently. One of the ways we seek God is to seek him together in community. We talked about this last week. We come together to worship God and to experience God. And, and there's a blessing that comes when we have to go out of our way to come and to gather together to meet with God. So I'm excited the next four months, there's going to be a, a, a greater presence here when we come with that expectation. Secondly, I don't know if you know this, but we don't have standard water anymore. We have emergency water from across the street. So that means we can fill up that baptismal tank as many times as we want. We don't get charged for it. So what I'm thinking is we should have a baptism service every Sunday. So get your pagan friends here. Get them in contact. Invite them along. And then we'll just get them wet. It's going to be fun. <laughs> oh. How many of you, 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 be honest with this question, okay? How many of you, 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 you suspect that if, if you had a machine to teleport anywhere at any t at, in a moment's notice, if you could just step into this machine and be right where you wanted to be, how many of you would agree you'd probably still be a few more? Come on. Some of you who showed up late here aren't putting up your hands. I know that. Okay, I'll give you grace because you had to find parking six blocks away. But um, there's something that we need to deal with. And I started this series last week. We talked about the, the rhythm of being with God and it's sent out from God. It's not that we're away from, we're, we're, it's not that we're with God and away from God. We are sent out as his representative. We're sent out as his emissaries. We're sent out as his ambassador. So when Jesus was with God, he came, he was sent out from God and he went with power every time. And so we need to be well. What we're going to talk about today is how do we recognize God when we're not together? How do we bring him into the day-to-day -day of our everyday? He's already there, but how do we recognize him? I told you last week that this series is one of the most countercultural series that I've ever done. Because it's not only countercultural, culture of the society. It's countercultural to the culture of the church. And it's going to rub us the wrong way. It's not going to seem right. It's going to be offensive. I'm, I'm warning you this. You might, you, know, you might just dismiss it as trite and this is inconsequential, but that, you're, you're deceived. It's something to say, okay, God, I give you my life, but what does that mean in the day-to-day -day of every day? What does that mean in, in my conversations with my family, my friends, my coworkers, my neighbors, my, my, my loved ones? Is it making a difference in, in how I approach life? Is it making a difference in, in how I reach out to others? Jesus said in Matthew or in, in, in Matthew, Peterson transliterated it this way. He said, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me and get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, 
work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Are you learning to live freely and lightly? Uh, have, you, have you thought about this rhythm of abiding with you? Where, where you have those times whether they're gathered on Sunday or gathered in the week or with the times alone with God where, where you are receiving power to do the things he wants you to do. Get into that rhythm. Today I'll show you, we'll get to that, how, how it practically works. Before we get there, well, well, we'll talk about the rhythm of margin and how it works, but... I can't just talk about the rhythm of margin because it is so, some of you live this way and it, you're thinking I'm crazy talking this way, but the rest of us, we, it is so bizarre to our thinking. It's so out there because you're never going to get the rhythm of margin if, if you think busyness is a virtue. Do you think busyness is a virtue? Yeah, you say that now. But, you know, when someone asks you, how are you, do you answer busy with a bit of a smile? It's the shorthand for how we, inter we, we talk to each other. Busy means I'm productive. Busy means I'm doing work. Busy means I'm being creative. Busy means it means I'm, I'm doing something. If I know you really well and you say I'm busy, I will tell you, you're sinning, stop. If I don't know you that well and I want to get to know you better and you say you're busy, I'll say, well, are you, is it the feeling of busyness or are you actually just doing a lot of stuff? Because you can do a lot of stuff and never feel busy. It's not a matter of how much you do, it's that feeling that cripples you. If I don't know you at all and you tell me that you're busy, I just, I, I almost bleed through my tongue. It's just like, live that way. You were created to walk with God in the garden of the That's the way he wants you to live. Sin came into the world and you bore the consequences, but Jesus came and reversed the curse and took your place and offered you his yoke, that, his burden that is light. We want to be busy because it absolves us from the responsibility of doing. It's kind of like walking around with no change in your pockets because if someone asks you for change, you can be honest and say, I don't have it. It's the same thing. If I'm busy, I can't be called upon to serve. If I'm busy, no friend can ask too much of me. If I'm busy, I, 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 can, be, I, I, I can be too busy to care too I can keep you at a distance. I can shut you down from invading my space if, you, if I'm busy. Can I just tell you that you don't have to? Look at how Jesus lived. He had enough minutes every day. He wasn't rushed or influenced by any other people's schedule. He was never in a hurry and he showed compassion to people's intrusions. He took time to be with the Father and time to recreate. He took time for meals even after he died and rose again. He ate. He accomplished the work he was given to do. So why is he so much different than we are? He's God. Well, give it up. What does he have that we don't have? Better yet, what do we have that he doesn't have? You need to understand one of the, the, the root of busyness, the feeling of busyness. Not, I'm not talking, I, I preached this one time, and, and I had a good friend, just, he had to sit me down, and we spent three hours going through this because he had a lot on the go. He was really, and, and he, he didn't want to be sinning. And, and what are you saying? Can I not have a lot on? I said, no, it's, it's, not, it's not about doing a lot. 
It's good to do a lot. It's good to be productive. It's good to honor God with our work. It's good to work as unto the Lord. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that feeling of this. That feeling that says, I, I can't get it all done. That feeling that says, I'm out of control. That feeling is what I'm talking about. That feeling of busyness, the byproduct. Busyness is a byproduct of shame. Let me show you where I found it. Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 22. It says, The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to him. And the man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and they shall, she shall be called woman. Woe, man, because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and and father, and be united to his wife and in flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt shame. Interesting, he highlighted, God highlighted. Then look, look what happens in, in chapter 3. He says, Now a serpent was more crafty than the, all the other wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, and by the way, that's the attack of the enemy. He'll ask you, did God really say? Did God really say that? Is God really that good? Did he really say that? Watch that. Anyway, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the tree uh, of the garden, but the God did say you must not eat from the, tree of, from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And both of their eyes, uh, and, and their eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord of the God, the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God said to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid uh, because I was naked. You've heard the joke of the pastor who the house and and answer. so he leaves a little so it says will I stand at the door and knock and, and Sunday uh, whose house gave him the card back with verse on there uh, Genesis 2.11 uh, and he looked it up afterward and it said, he realized he said I heard you in the garden and so, because I was so it's not a real it's a pastor um, shame comes in shame came in you understand the difference between shame guilt is on what you it's it's not and shame is on who you let's keep on reading we'll jump to verse 63 to the woman he said I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing with the pain you will give birth to your husband your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you to Adam he said because you listened to your wife and he which I commit, you must not. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of the brow, your feet will return to, to the ground, since from it you were taken. To dust you are, and to dust you are. Shame came into the world because of the toil or busyness came into
viper. When we're asked what do we do today, I was at work and checking my email and followed a link to something on Facebook together because there was a series of cat videos and I responded to those calls that were procrastinating making but it turned out it only took one. I could have had the reports done but I didn't know how to do them and I was afraid to ask someone for help because if I don't know what I do, I'll lose my job. It was just an email. We need to be intentional in our lives so that we don't waste time. We need to be excellent in our jobs because we're going to be excellent to the Lord. We need to be present in our relationships because that's what taught, but we don't need to feel busy, and we won't feel busy unless we're doing something out of shame or doing something to avoid feeling shame. When you're guilted into doing something and voluntarily to do something for fun, it's a shame. A guilt is on stuff we do, and if, if we've done something, this, the pattern is simple. God tells us to confess and agree with him that what we did was wrong, and, and repent and do the exact opposite. Confession and repentance. When we do something. To get rid of shame, it starts with repentance. Uh, confession and repentance. More to it. Core of who we are on our identity. friend Cheryl Shea, what is she, counselor, she wrote a book called Soul Surge, and she gives these categories for the strongholds of shame in our lives. This is how we get shame in our lives. Uh, direct put-downs, comparison, devaluing a child's interests, activities, or friends, put-down of others, any form of physical abuse or neglect, any form of sexual abuse. This is what she deals with when she's the stronghold. By shame. She goes on to state that the fruit of shame, what comes out of trying to avoid shame, is perfectionism, procrastination, in people pleasing, feeling of inferiority or inadequacy, workaholism, secretiveness, or withdrawal. And that's why we get busy. Procrastinate. That's why we're so busy because. That's because we feel busy when we're trying to please people. We feel like we can't measure up. That's what we do. So how we deal with that is on the back of this sheet. You've got your notes. It's there. If you don't, grab one on the way out because it's good stuff. First off, you need to confess the sinful way that you've responded to the shame, the root of shame. I had to use this this week. I got an email with a letter that it was a it was a letter that a letter of rejection. And at first, I was shocked and hollowed out, and then I was angry. Make sure you don't do anything stupid. Uh, you know, I journaled things out and kind of got the next steps in my mind. I contacted Sean. I went for a drive, and while I was driving, this sermon went through my head. And I realized this first step was something I needed. I needed to confess my sin because I, I was caring more about their opinion of me than I cared about God. And that's sin. So I had to ask forgiveness for that and say, God, help me value more highly than you. We do that with anybody. That's we're going to get into trouble. But your opinion is who God says you are. And then I, I asked God, I said, God, just, just 
help me know, like, what do you, show me something. And, and he gave me this vision, and it wasn't an open vision. I was driving. And, and I saw this vision that Karen and I were, were being held by Jesus. And, and we were struggling against it. And we're like little kids just trying to get away from parents because be held, and it's pushing against. And then the scene went back, and I saw this storm that was coming against us and saw Jesus protecting us from the storm. And so we had to decide just to stop struggling and rest in the storm. And I'm telling you, this is a process. It does, it's not one picture and you're done. This is a grieving process I'm going through, and, and I've got to bring that picture back and say, thank you, Jesus. I thank you that you showed me. I thank you I can trust you. I thank you that what you say about me is more important than what you say about me. Confess the sinful way you've been. There's a prayer there. There's a prayer. Then if you're going through this process, you, you ask God, ask the Father to remind you. Make the choice to forgive them for that as well. Because parents, sometimes we do this. If you're a parent, never say shame. Never. Ask forgiveness and let it stop. But if it's been done to you, you this is a prayer you can release from the shame. Then the next thing you can do is you ask the Father to break the lies that you yourself and just show me and the, the steps are there you, have to, you ask God to heal whatever he wants to a memory what's the lie you want to break and uh, now you can do this by yourself Need someone that got social training, need a foster. Um, Karen and I have done Pastor Sean. Don't live out of the shame. But guess what? You're a new creation. It doesn't matter what's happened. It doesn't matter if it happened last week. You are new. Don't live in that shame. The final step that comes from Cheryl, it's all Cheryl stuff, get, get and give shame to a relationship. Get in a place and strengthen. Hey, church is a great place for it. <laughs> Remember last week, talked about getting together in church and getting together in small groups, and that's when that happens. So it's not only to connect with God, but it's to connect with God through people with skin on. You know, when you show up here, you're God with skin on to somebody else. You can give a hug or a high five or, or a prayer or something, and it's exactly what they needed that day. Some days you're going to need it, and someone will come and do that for you. But when you're coming here, come with a word for somebody. Come with just, you see them, and you just want to give them a hug. If it's not, it'll be. Um, when we are free from busy, the feeling of busyness, from be, feeling the shame of we can talk about because I tell you, it is it is it's wonderful when you use it, and you won't believe it until you try it, because it is so stinking bizarre. It comes. Uh, from the Benedictine monks. They practice this uh, tool called statio. And statio literally means the time between moments. And what they do, the moment between moments, what they do is, it's a, it's a practical working out of brain is practicing. It's saying, okay, I wake up in the morning and I take a breath and I realize God. 
instead of saying, good God, it's for me, what I do is I make, and how I make, I do pour over coffee, and it's, it's fresh. And you just put a little bit. It, it does. It pops, and it's awesome. It is absolutely. It's, it's taking those moments between moments when, when you just take a breath and realize God is here. It's, it's when, let me just, I'll read you some of what their writers write, okay? This is from Joan Chisler, Wisdom, from Distil, Wisdom Distilled from the Daily Living, uh, Living the Rules of St. Benedict the Day. She says, if I am present to this child before I dress her, then the dressing becomes an act of creation. If I'm present to my spouse in the living room, then marriage becomes an act of divine communion. If I'm present to the flower before I cut it, then life becomes precious. If I'm present to the time of prayer before I pray, then prayer becomes a junction, juncture of the divine. We have learned well in our time to go through life nonstop. Now it's time to learn to collect ourselves from time to time so that God can touch us in the most hectic of moments. The practice of statio is meant to center us and make us conscious that what we're about to do, uh, uh, makes it, make us conscious about what we're about to do and make us present to God who is present. Statio is the desire to do consciously what I mother, might otherwise do mechanically. Statio is the virtue, presence. Stadio is making the white space. That's what I talked about. And it's the white space of life. And in that white space, you recognize God is God. Can I tell you? Miracles happen. Miracles happen. It's when we take that time to just say, It's that breath we take before we respond to someone who's yelling at us. At we just say, thank you, Jesus. You can start to see the person. Why they're there. It's that moment when, when we uh, are, are about to rush off. Somewhere. We just stop and it matters. It matters if I'm present. It matters if I'm present. The point of Stadio is to ruthlessly hurry. It's a matter of pausing. Thanks. Giving is a big thanks to God. What I've started to do, and this works well for me, it'll probably work well for most of you, not find every time I go for my phone. Not for the phone, just it's so easy for me to go on here and go on social media, forget all about everything. Just go and no, before that, every touch your phone, except the voicemail. Before you go to the voicemail, before you check your email, before you check social, media, before you play that game, before you just touch it. From, I don't have a watch. I don't know the time. Okay, great. Pause and it's a slowing down. It's a refusal to feel busy. I can see you getting anxious. All the time. <laughs> it's who I am. No! You were created to walk with God in the garden. That. How do you practice it? My challenge to you is every touch your feet. God is slow down enough to say okay in this moment 
the one way that God has done this for me in the past is I'll be talking for coffee, feel my arm just kind of, and I look to see if I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's like I know God's going to do something. And so then I'm looking, and as soon as I feel that, it's like, okay, God, is there a way that I can? God loves me. A word of hope. Is there something? I know God can do something. The same thing can happen when you just pause. Touching your phone. Okay, God, what do you want? Who do I take to? What word of encouragement? Can I just praise you? Understand, we are so blessed to be in the kingdom of God. We don't need to sacrifice animals to, to experience God. We don't need to be bought, born in the right tribe to draw close to God. We don't need to, it, it, it is, we are so far removed from the blessing we have. But never lose that. Jesus is as close as the mention of his name. He is there the moment we just pause and say, thank you, Jesus. And it's in those moments that, that life begins to lighten up. It's in those moments that you, you, you get to see God's going to do something crazy there. It might be just a smile. It might be a hug. It might be... It might be you're, you've made that person's decision that, that they've been struggling with, and worried about. It's in the day to day of God shows up. Place. We can have a. And we can just go through the process and it can be like every other day. We just celebrate. You can say, God, thank you. And give space right now to experience God fresh and real. I'm going to ask the musicians to come back. That last song you sang for this message starts my, as they start singing it, I invite Mr. Sean. He'll, he'll start organizing. Who's ever going to serve communion, start passing. Let me just close this part. Holy Spirit, we thank you. You are already here. And it's not because of the song we sang. We show it. So, Lord, right now, first of all, I pray for anyone who just came aware of the fact that they are living their life out of shame. I pray, Lord God, that they would find release even now in this moment, but if they need help, they would look for it and know that they would receive it. Lord, I pray for all of us who are so full of life, we're just, we're, we're too busy. Not just we don't, we, we stop saying the word and keep on being as busy and have the same feeling, but Lord God, it would stop in the name of Jesus. And we would live in your moments. We would have those times of being close to you and empowered by you. And in the moments we're away, where we're, when you're, we're your witnesses, where we're doing the work that you want us to do in this world, that, that, Lord, you, we experience you in those moments and miracles follow us. Lord, I pray a blessing upon each and every one. And, Lord, in this, you're not done doing what you want to do here, Lord God. So, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive what you want to say.